Um, I've, uh, I have a four-year-old daughter back home. I've taken the practice now of doing a selfie every time I do a talk so I can show it to her. So I need you to all wave to her, please. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's great. You did your job. Um, so now I'll do mine. So um, my name is Mark Rahasia. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, I, I did my best. I was on a plane somewhere over the Atlantic trying to, like, think up my, like, catcher in the rye, like, title for what I want to talk about. Interestingly, I think because of my lateness in submitting it, 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 it says something different on your paper. So I'm going to talk about something different than what it says there. Um, I'm going to talk about the work that I'm doing uh, with my team uh, back in New York and in London. Uh, we are called August. So um, what is August? August is an org uh, transformation consultancy. Uh, we work um, pretty much exclusively with organizations of scale or that are rapidly scaling uh, and that are grappling with their own scale and complexity. Does that sound familiar to the people here? Am I in the right room? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so this is my team. Uh, I'm going to talk, it's actually, uh, we started about a year ago. Um, there's three more people that have joined in the last, since this picture was taken. Um, but I'm going to talk a lot about team. Team is a very important lens for us in our work. Um, I, uh, I love this group. It is a group with uh, intense debate and passion for uh, changing the world of work as it exists today. Um, and you should meet them all sometimes. They're great, they're great people. Um, so, a lot of the last five years of my life has been spent trying to recognize patterns in what makes organizations of scale actually thrive today. One of those patterns that we have seen, obviously, and I think should resonate for all of you, is purpose. Um, I, I really appreciate those organizations that are purpose first, that express the reason they exist, what's the dent they're trying to make in the universe. So this is ours. We debated it for a while. Why the word capable? Capable is not sexy. What about high performing? Uh, we, we debated meaningful a whole lot uh, when working with public companies in the Fortune 500. Um, but, uh, and I think a good purpose statement invites that kind of debate and interrogation. Um, but everything that we do, all of the work that we do with these large organizations, we put through this lens as a guide for us of whether we're going in the right direction. Um, as a sort of goodie, and, and these slides will be fully available to you. Actually, our entire Google Drive is public and available to the world. Everything that isn't client confidential is open. Uh, our salaries, our equity, all that stuff, you can go and look at it. Um, and these slides, too. Uh, so these are some of the patterns that we have recognized and what makes teams extremely capable today. Some of these should resonate because they uh, are drawn directly from sources like Lean Startup. Uh, we are a highly integrative team in our theory, um, but these are some of the, the, the patterns that we've observed. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this towards the end of the talk. So I, I, I've spoken to this. I don't know how many of you come from a startup background or an entrepreneurial background, but um, I thought it was sort of valuable to point out that like, in this, with this group here, there's this question sort of of what, what happens if it works? You know, like what happens if that entrepreneurial effort actually works and suddenly you get all the, everything that you wanted, everything that you were asking for, all this scale and leverage on the world. So this is exactly where we play, where that sort of like, uh, moment that, that happens when suddenly it starts to grow and it gets big and you're just stuck under the weight of that complexity when, you know, and, and I'm going to talk about this sort of duality that exists today where we have all these people inside big organizations today that get it, that have read Lean Startup, that want to test and learn, that want to work in these new ways, but they're just, they're, 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 they're buckling under the weight of the organization, this thing that's supposed to make it easier for them, but instead is making it harder. So uh, a quick uh, entry point into the rest of the talk, uh, and I'm looking for actual shows of hand here, hand here. Do you know anyone who haggles, and I'm not saying you might be sitting next to a colleague, so you don't have to call them out, um, just anyone that you've ever worked with who haggles over the precise wordings of communications minutes or resolutions? Okay. How about someone who refers back to matters decided upon uh, at the last meeting and attempts to reopen the advisability of that discussion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what about someone, you know, that really kind of fastidious person who's like, there's a right way to do things and we've got to do them through this particular channel. Have you ever worked with someone like this? So congratulations, uh, your organization is being sabotaged. 
This is from 1954. Uh, it's an actual organization that, that was a precursor to the CIA. Uh, and they made this, this guide for general interference with organizations. Things that you should do. Insist on doing everything through channels. Make speeches. Stand up and just make speeches, and you will slow the organization down. So we joke about all these things, but this is the reality that's happening inside our organizations. So our, our sort of beginning point today that gives us the hubris to purport to have a perspective on how, how organizations should, should organize and work is that it is, um, it is a fact, it is an observable fact that work as it exists today does not work. Um, some supporting data, I'm going to move through this quickly because I think this group is very familiar with this stuff. Um, since 65, return on assets. Um, this basically the point here is that the economic engine of our organizations is slowing down. It's not working, okay? Return on assets has halved. Uh, labor productivity has tripled. So basically, we're spinning faster, we're getting more stuff done, but we're getting less return from it. Uh, how many of you have seen this before? This is, this is the, the Gallup study about engagement in the workplace, okay? So basically, when you read this, what you should see is that only 13%, this is a global survey, okay? Global survey uh, of work. Only 13% of people describe themselves as being engaged. 24% say actively disengaged, which basically means that they are, like, either actively undermining the organization or trying to escape, okay? So think about that in the context of, so I'm actually, I'm, I'm Canadian, um, but we live in the United States. I've been in the States for seven years. Uh, that means that approximately 108 million people go to work every day and are just bummed. They're just like, this, this sucks, I'm not into this. We should change this, right? We need to do something about this. Um, but, you know, presumably, at least even if you're bummed with your job, it's stable, right? You're going to be around for a long time. Well, the bad news is that uh, back in, in 58, these were the years of, like, Scrooge McDuck swimming in the pile of coins, you know? You could, like, if you were the big company in the S&P 500, you could sit there on top of your stack of coins and everything would be good. You'd, you'd have 60 years to kind of look out in front of you. And what we've seen, this is Richard Foster's work in Creative Destruction, that over time, the lifespan of those organizations has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. So basically, um, whereas before it was great to be big, now it's risky. So then the OECD came out with this report recently that, that called, they called this class of companies frontier firms. We, at August, call them responsive organizations. Um, same, same thing, same observation, that there's this other set of companies that amidst VUCA, amidst all the stuff happening out there, are thriving that are actually able to create almost boundless growth while everyone else is like just struggling to get out one little like, you know, one little bit of it. Uh, and, 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 and so if you look at those frontier firms, basically what we've seen is that uh, the time that it takes them to generate enormous value is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. I think Slack should be up here as well off to the right. Um, so basically, now, today, you can walk up to the table, you can roll the dice, doesn't work, you can roll the dice again, and you can achieve enormous scale and create incredible value extremely quickly. You all know this. Everyone knows who this is, right? This is SpaceX. When this moment happened, it was just amazing. Like, I found, I found my, my, it took my breath away. I was like, the, the, the achievement, the, um, you know, it almost seems like there's some companies out there that have an unfair advantage that are, that are working maybe in a completely different way. So this is the, uh, the sort of Dickensian moment that I feel that we're living in right now. On the one hand, everything is amazing. It's so amazing. You can, you can start a company like from scratch. You can rescale it to, to billions of people in a short period of time, and yet your, you know, 87% of your wives and husbands and children are bummed every day at their work. It is the best of times, it is the worst of times. So uh, this is a highly politicized representation of the US healthcare system that I'm using to make a point, which is basically that um, with scale comes incredible complexity, okay? And so it is no wonder that healthcare.gov turned out the way that it did when they did it. There was, there was, no, there was no chance, and you know, I, I, I use relatively strong words when I talk about this, but um, it is our position that big consulting and the approaches that they're bringing to the problems that, uh, that large companies are having today, that they are ineffective and inherently dishonest. That basically, it is 
impossible to look at the complexity of a GE's 300,000 people, you know? Uh, PepsiCo's 230,000 people. Estee Lauder's 50,000 people. We're talking about huge, huge numbers of people. That it is impossible to look at a, an organization of that scale and as a consultant or an internal team, wrap your head around its complexity and possibly design the right organization, the right structure, the right change process, that you can possibly do that. So our, our belief is that that is actually not possible. It is, it is dishonest or naive and that um, you are hemorrhaging time and money trying to convince yourself that you can design the right solution or the right structure for that, and that we need, we need something else. So our way of working is out of date. Um, this should look familiar to you in the background. Uh, can anyone guess what organization this is for? So this was for the U.S. Pacific Railway in 1910, okay? That's 107 years ago. Does anyone, uh, what do you notice about this? It's the same thing. Yes, it's exactly the same thing. If you actually could, if you could see even like in the middle of a couple places, they've got the same dotted line, you know, that the greatest gift of, of corporate America is like having multiple bosses because, you know, every, everyone loves that. Had the same stuff, same stuff happening back then, okay? Um, so think about that. Think about 1910, 107 years ago, okay? This is not, uh, our office isn't based in, in Brooklyn, but this is actually not a photo of Williamsburg or Oakland. Um, this, is, uh, this is a photo, I, I searched long and hard for the right picture from 1910. Think about the world in 1910. Think about what it was like. Women didn't have the right to vote. Um, most homes didn't have plumbing in them, you know? All those things, we've come to this, the, to the, the logical conclusion that we have to change those things, and yet this, this is the same. So much of how we organize and work, we don't consider, and, and I guess one of the ideas that I want you to take away from this is that it is, of course, it is essential to get inspired by the theory, um, uh, and I'm going to talk about all the different theory that has influenced us, that that is extremely valuable, um, but you have to, you have to look at the the connective tissue of the organization and consider the biases that it carries inside it that you don't even think about. The next time that you're asked to make a two-year roadmap to predict what's gonna happen two years from now, when our ability to do that has vanished, okay? We are hemorrhaging time inside our organizations, applying an operating model and a way of working for a world that doesn't exist anymore. So, the way that we think about this this, um, this question is on the spectrum of certainty and uncertainty. Most organizations were designed for that, were designed for certainty. Think about that, that org chart, okay? Think about how, how quickly the, move, the, the world moved at that time. Think about how quickly things changed. You had time, like think about, so we know Columbus didn't discover America actually, but you know, when he you know, came over and he sees that there's people there and he wants to send a message back to the queen, in Spain, he'd like sent a ship back across the ocean, you know, and it took like a couple of years, it took a few years to make a decision. And that was fine, because things moved really slowly, okay? So we have applied a model into our organizations for how we plan, how we budget, how we invest, how we hire, how we reward, all those things were designed for that world, all of them. Not just the way we're working in our teams, but all of it. And yet this is the stuff that we actually need to get good at. So. August, we are not, uh, I, I'm not up here claiming that we are the, um, the shamans and the, uh, that we, we know all of this stuff. There is, as all of you know, there is a rich body of theory that is kind of converging at this point of time that's pushing us to basically to address this problem and to reinvent work. Lean Startup is, is but one of those. Um, most of these should, should be familiar to you. If they aren't, I encourage you to become students of all of it. Um, and so... What we have done at August is to take all of that and to uh, bring it together and the patterns that we're recognizing in organizations that are working into a new operating system, a new operating model for scale. Um, so basically our answer to the question of how to be big and not break is to, is to actually, first of all, acknowledge that you have an OS. Your organization, just like this phone does, just like this laptop does, your organization has an OS. Your teams have an OS, your leaders have an OS and that that OS right now is biased in one direction and you, gotta, you actually have to like switch its biases, its assumptions. And, and you have to switch them in the direction of assuming that you're wrong. Let me explain what I mean by that. So 
the, this is a, a, a simplified representation of the existing operate, operating model in most organizations. Uh, we, we refer to it as the industrial era model, that it is closed and efficient and controlled. And I want to make an important point here, which is that we are not saying that it is bad. Okay, that it's a bad model. It was the perfect model for a particular time, and it is the perfect model for a particular set of conditions. And those conditions are that, when things are certain. But how many of the missions that you're on in your organizations would you describe as certain? Where, where the answer is knowable, where you, you, you already know that you're right. So our, our response to that is what we call a responsive operating model that is open instead of closed, that is focused on learning instead of efficiency and that, it, that is uh, optimizing for the network instead of for control, okay? These themes should sound familiar to you. So, generally speaking, the industrial era model carries these biases, these opinions, these assumptions. And basically that assumption is that you're right, that you know the right answer, you know, that it, if, if you're gonna make a two-year roadmap, of like what you're gonna do two years from now, it's because you believe and you know that you're doing the right thing. So you just gotta execute against that thing, okay? Whereas the responsive model has a different assumption, it's a different bias, a different opinion, and that is that we're probably wrong. Maybe not 100% wrong, but a little bit wrong in some ways. And so how should we work? How should we invest? How should we hire if we're probably a little bit wrong? We might wanna do all those things a little bit differently. <laughs> so um, does everyone agree with me? Robbed at the Oscars? This was a, yeah. Um, so <laughs> my, my team, uh, uh, we, we argue about this slide. I, it's it's a, an analogy that I enjoy making. Um, so this is, to me, this is the state of the, of the modern, uh, well, of the, of the scaled organization in this world today. So 10 years ago, the people inside the organizations, honestly, their ideas, their literacy around the internet and what it was going to mean for, for how they organized was not that high, okay? Everyone was still figuring that stuff out. Today, it's different. Everyone's red lean startup. They have great ideas. They have good taste. They have, you know, they have good ideas for what they want to do. But they're trapped inside this vessel <laughs> that is careening towards the, uh, the airplane hangar and is going to explode. And they're fighting against it. This is, this is what I observe. I meet these awesome people inside these big organizations that want to do meaningful work and want to bring exciting, amazing stuff into the world. And they are grappling with this thing that's supposed to make it easier for them. And instead, it's just like they're fighting against where it's steering them. So we should change this, right? So first, to acknowledge, and I, after sort of dis, dissing Big Consulting earlier, this is from a report that came from Big Consulting, so thank you for that. 70% um, of transformation programs fail. We hesitate sometimes to even call ourselves a transformation consultancy because that word has baggage now, and they never work, so everyone just wants to kind of sweep them under the rug. So these, this is our observation of the assumptions, again, that are, that are seeped into traditional change efforts that we can predict what will work, that controlling the process will improve the outcomes, that change is different from everyday work, that only special people do it over there, they're the change people, the change experts, um, that the change will last, you know, that once we do that, we can kind of sit back and watch, everything's gonna be okay again. Uh, and that tension in the process is to be minimized, that it's a bad thing, that, you know, if it's not working, that that is something that we want to we want to be quiet about. We don't want to say, heaven forbid, that we learn from it, that we harness it. So the strategies that we are using in trying to to help organizations transition to this new world, um, this is some of them. Uh, and again, uh, perpetual beta. Okay, you can expect everything that we are doing. We our assumption is that we're probably a little bit wrong about everything. Uh, is Principles, even over process and structure, yes, process and structure matter, but what matters more is what the people in the organization believe and what principles are embedded in the processes and your reward systems and how you budget and how you invest and plan. Iteration, even over stability. We don't go in and say to them, here's what the change process is gonna look like for the next two years, because we don't know. We don't know what's gonna work yet. We don't know what the teams are gonna respond well to. Um, Opt-in, even over rollout, okay? So, and, and I, I heard uh, Viv uh, talk about this in G's context earlier. Um, it is entirely voluntary. Our process is to go and improve what a different way of working looks like in a pocket of the organization and, and tell stories about it and get people to, to, to raise their hand and say they want to be a part of it, to harness the tension instead of minimizing it, and importantly for the leaders that 
that we, we tend to assume that their role is to direct the change, you know, be the, the captain at the top front of the ship and point people in the right direction. But when it's much more essential, and we're not saying again, these things on the right, they're not, they're, they're not bad. Strategy is about choice. Strategy is about choosing a good thing over another good thing, okay? We want our leaders to guide and direct. We want to use the wisdom that they have. But even more important than that is that they model these principles, that they decide in new ways. So this is, at a, at a very uh, high level, what it looks like for us inside organizations today. Um, we're, there's four kind of main areas where we are applying emphasis or focus. Um, initially, on the leadership, uh, this is about the soil that we're planting this in. It is probably the single greatest barrier to new ways of organizing and working is the dearth of ready leaders to, that, are, that are ready to you know, uh, that are ready to put themselves on the line and, um, and, and take a risk in a new way of working. We have to get to the mindset that they have. It's probably the hardest thing about that, frankly, is their calendars. Like most of you in this, in this room, I'm sure, like their calendars are a disaster, an utter disaster. Um, the second place that we focus is on accelerating particular priorities of the business, and that is all about building mythology in the organization. We have to prove it. If you're gonna do an opt-in change process, you need evidence that a new way of working works on things that are important. So we go and actually train and coach. We assemble teams and train and coach them that are working on priorities of the organization and prove that in maybe a quarter of the time that they can get to a better outcome faster with more engagement. Um, once we've established that, we focus on grassroots, grassroots movements. That's where we're talking about things that scale. We're talking about content. We're talking about internal coaching and, and training certification programs, building an army of people inside the organization that frankly can replace us. Um, and the last part, and this is the important part I was talking about before, is the connective tissue of the organization, how we reward our strategic planning process, uh, how we allocate resources. All of those things carry these insidious biases of the 20th century. And we actually need to, it's almost like gene therapy. We need to, we need to in, insert new biases into those processes. So this looks like us piloting new versions of those processes. So um, we, again, we're probably wrong. These are the questions that we're asking the teams that we're working with today to get a signal about whether what we're doing is working with them. Do you have the authority and the autonomy to make mission critical decisions? Are you clear about your role? Do you hide your failures? Do you have access to what you need? All of these things, what we're finding is that in just 12 weeks, we can have an actual, a relatively radical impact on the way that a team works. I'm happy to talk more about this after. Um, and this is the last, the last thing that I want to share. Um, this actually just came up last week. And it just, like, this, this is what gets me springing out of bed in the morning. So this is uh, a director in a Fortune 100 organization that we work with, actually based in the UK. He's involved in manufacturing. This isn't like a digital person. This is a guy who works in manufacturing. Unfortunately for him, he was on sick leave recently. He was out of the business for six months. And when he came back, this is what he had to say. For what it's worth, I'm just coming back from a lengthy period of illness, and the messaging, tone, delivery methodology, and sense of urgency is palpably sharper and fresher than when I stepped out of the business in March. That would be my message as someone who feels through six months of almost total isolation from business stimuli and interaction, as close to a rehire as one could get. Like he re-entered the organization, felt like he was in a different place. So it's basically um, in contrast to the transformation never works thing, I just want to assert that it's possible that the thing that you're trying to do in your organization can happen and it can work and work can be this meaningful, awesome, amazing thing. That is, that is, um, that is my personal purpose, frankly, is for everyone to feel about their work the way that I feel about mine. Uh, thank you. That's it. Great job. Uh, so we've got some questions coming in on Slido. We're at the Bayview Enterprise uh, track, just if you want to get your uh, questions in, because we, we have a few minutes. Uh, just before we get into that, uh, Eric was saying yesterday uh, that uh, people uh, invite him in and say, look, we're totally up for this, man. We're, we're, we're all in. He goes, no, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, how, do you, uh, how do you know if somebody's going to really be worthwhile working with or really commit to what you're going to do yourselves? Uh, that's a great question. Um, 
So the first thing is, uh, it, I, I agree, we agree wholeheartedly with that statement. Out of every 10 leaders that say that they want to do this, maybe one or two of them are actually ready, ready and well positioned to do this. Um, and, and the honest answer is that we don't always know when we go in. And so we've actually um, set up our offering in such a way that even if a client wanted to do a scaled multi-year transformation with us, we would say no to it at the beginning. And we start with a pilot for a period of time to find out where, where we think of it basically as, as two stages of seeding and scaling. And part of the seeding process for us is to establish whether the conditions are actually present for, for this to work. Um, but, but that said, um, it's a lot of time, the, the time before we even get a contract is an essential moment. It's a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of meals, a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussions, uh, and usually there's something a little bit crazy about, about doing this and about working with us, frankly, because no one knows we exist. We're 14 people in a co-working space in Brooklyn, um, working with Fortune 100s. And, and so for someone to, to take this leap, um, they have to be a little bit bonkers. Uh, and so we're, we're, looking, we're looking for people that, are, um, that get it, that feel a sense of urgency about it, that have the social and political capital, and this is an important thing in the organization, to, to bring others along, um, all, all of those things. And we might get it wrong. Sometimes we do. Cool. Sorry, I'm just checking Facebook here. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> going, going for the question. So uh, what do you think uh, if the entire team become product owners? They will pitch their ideas and report their learning to all the stakeholders directly. So, question: What do you think if the entire team become product owner, owners? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but I, I'll, I'll say um, that kind of, uh, generally speaking, a big part of our work is about uh, distribution of authority and 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 basically pushing authority to teams so that they are autonomous and self-sufficient. So we want uh, not just, we don't want everyone to be a product owner. We want the entire team to have a shared sense of purpose and the authority to get the mission done, to treat it as if they own it. Um, and that, this is an interesting thing, actually. When we talk to, when I talk to leaders of organizations and I ask them if their teams have a lot of autonomy, they say, oh, yes, absolutely. They're very free to go and do stuff. And then when we talk to the teams and we ask them, do you have a lot of autonomy? They say, no, 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 we, 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 we can't. And the, 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 this is the important thing is neither of them are lying. The, the, the problem is that it's fuzzy. It's not clear. It's not explicit. So some of our work is about actually um, making uh, what is implicit explicit. Um, and even if it's wrong, write down where decision rights sit in the organization. Make it a point of negotiation between a team that's being given a mission and their sponsor what authority they need to get it done. Write it down and edit it over time if it might be wrong. Mm, cool. Um, yeah, so the, the next one is, uh, what do you actually literally do with teams? Can you give us a few tangible examples of, yeah. of, of when you get into it? Absolutely. Um, so I think I have, um, I want to see if I might have this. I might even have it in here. Um, While well, you're getting that, the, the Google Drive is very cool. And on your website, it, it kind of gives a good overview of how you work and four yeah. week kind of cycles and how it looks. It's great. So uh, I removed this from the talk. So um, what, uh, <laughs> what we have discovered is that, um, Again, like maybe seven, think the world, this has gotten really easy for us these days. Like it used, seven years ago, uh, when I found myself going to talk to leadership teams and saying, the single greatest capacity your organ, organization needs to develop is to change. You need to grow that capacity um, to be adaptive, to be responsive in how you work. They were kind of there, but there wasn't this sense of urgency about it. Today, honestly, every leadership team that I meet with is like, yes, we've been trying to do this for a couple of years. How do you do this? Like, how do you practically actually do it on a day-to-day -day basis? And this is, and, and honestly, like, um, I am obviously clothed, but underneath these clothes are scars and bruises from five years of learning. Because uh, I didn't start in change, you know? I've, like, I've, I've gone through the brutal process of learning how to make, how to help change happen in an organization. Um, and so this has been a learning process for us. So what we've discovered is that everyone is, is 
deeply hungry for practical things to do on a day-to-day -day basis that can shift this in the organization. And this is the thing. These things, from our perspective, are a Trojan horse, okay? Um, there are hundreds. We have a deep well of particular practices of ways of working, of how you meet, how you make decisions, how you structure your teams. There are practices for all of these things, all those things that I, I pointed at the beginning. Um, but the important thing actually aren't the, these tools and practices. The important thing is that, and what we've learned is that, uh, that through repetition of new, of new practices, mindsets shift. And that's the actual important thing. What you actually need is call it like 10% of your organizations to believe in their heart that working open is better than being closed, that they actually shouldn't like hide their work for two months and then re make a grand reveal of it, that that's harmful. They need to believe that differently, but you can't just get them into a training session and say, hey, believe different things. You actually have to try doing st different stuff for a period of time. So to answer your question, um, what our work looks like is to, um, to work with leaders to identify particular missions or priorities. We don't actually care what they are. It could be like, we've worked on new teams making new credit cards. We've worked with teams designing Super Bowl commercials. We've worked with like all kinds of teams doing different stuff. Um, and we, we actually, usually the teams are assembled in the wrong way. So, uh, so we start by designing that team to be autonomous and self-sufficient, making sure that it has the right composition. We introduce a new OS into that team. So basically, same mission, same group of people we've assembled, and, and we work with them and basically say, you're gonna do the same thing, but you're gonna try using different tools, different practices, different ways of meeting, um, different principles underlying your work. And we train them in these things, and we actually embed with them for a period of time uh, to coach them to, and facilitate their meetings for a period of time until they're trained to do it themselves. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's basically what it looks like. We actually embed with the teams and coach them. We also do one-on-one -on -one coaching with the leaders of those teams um, because the role of leading, if you're meant to distribute authority um, in organizations, this is a, a real crisis point we're discovering is that it's throwing a lot of leaders into the lurch um, it's a really destabilizing thing for them psychologically. They have been kind of sold a bum deal in a way, like they, they've been taught to manage and lead in one way, and then the board's being changed underneath them, um, and it feels really risky for them. So there's a lot of work that we have to do with those leaders to, um, to basically to help make it safe for them to show up in a different way and to, 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 to learn what the role of a leader is in that context. Nice. Uh, we're just slightly over time, but we might sneak in one last question. KT's got a question here, and she's not interested in just how to deal with resistance from a team. She's interested in how to deal with wild resistance from a team. <laughs> <laughs> wild Any quick ones? Wild resistance. Um, how to deal with wild resistance. The, so I, I think the, the, the best answer I can give to that is that um, an important thing before doing any work, frankly, uh, is, is an agreement or the, a set of agreements that a group of people working together have. Um, and so one of the things we actually do at the outset of most of our projects is a charter with the teams that um, basically uh, write down, that make explicit those agreements about why we're doing what we're doing. And so it kind of like, it gives us a set of commandments almost to kind of return back to and say, well, we agreed that we are... Um, that, that, that we are here to learn, that we trust each other, <laughs> which is a big thing. It sounds, it sounds trite to say that we trust each other, but there's a, a, a gross lack of that in a lot of teams and organizations. So, um, you know, I'd say that we try to prevent wild resistance by uh, getting, uh, actually, here's the, the word. You know how when you're on an airplane and they say um, exit rule, like exit rule rules, you have to say yes, you can help in a, in a moment of emergency? We actually, like, get the teams to, like, say, I am in to working this way, I'm into doing this. They have to like verbally say the words um, that they're gonna do it, and they still sometimes are resistant. Uh, so I guess my answer is we try to mitigate that at the outset, and we hold on for dear life. Cool, it's fantastic. Well look, we're gonna leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, I know you've got some great blog. Thank you. Great blog posts on LinkedIn, we can reach you there, and uh, yeah. check out the website.